Hi, I'm Carrie Hanks, and I'm the director of the Spanish Fork Salem Area Chamber of Commerce. And today we have our SAC lunch lecture, and we have with us Sonny Olson, and he's going to talk to us a little bit more about estate planning and the importance of that. Sonny? I appreciate the council having me again, and, and I appreciate this opportunity. This is really the second part of an estate planning series that we started. And the first part had to deal with, do you need an estate plan? When do you start it? And what are some, some of the basic tools? Today, we're going to start off with understanding what a trust is. And, and a lot of people think they understand what a trust is. Some do, most don't. And it's a very simple concept to understand. The trust is really, it's a relationship. It's represented by a set of documents, a relationship where property is managed by a person or persons or organizations for the benefit of another. Now wills, I told you last time, are not flexible. They're not pliable. And that's their downfall. And that's the reason why we had this, uh, new, the genesis of this new concept of a trust some 20, 25 years ago. Trusts are flexible, they are pliable, and when you meet and talk with your estate planning attorney, then you need to go in there with the understanding that you can really tell your attorney to write whatever it is that you want to accomplish. You can put bells and whistles. You can put conditions on gifts. You can have one, cru one trust create three other trusts. You can say, upon my death, I want $50,000 to go to my son to be held irrevocably in a separate trust until he turns 19 years old, in which case he will get it if he goes on an LDS mission. Okay, you can have something that says that person gets gets their gift at 25 when he or she, uh, in the trustee's opinion, doesn't have any creditors and is not going to spend that money on a bullet bike and kill themselves. And if you give it to them, then it can only be used for a down payment on a house or for some sort of postgraduate work or graduate work. You can put all kinds of conditions on things. You can say, do not give this person a gift until they've passed three successive drug tests. You're telling the trustee, do not give this money unless these conditions are met. And I have something funny in my trust, and I, I like to tell people about this. My trust says, at the time I turn 62, the trustee is going to be this person. This person's going to meet with me every year, and we're going to talk about how many of my kids and grandkids come to see me. Because by then, I'm probably going to be old and grumpy like my grandpa was old and grumpy. And I watched my grandpa sit down on his farm alone, and that's not going to happen to me. I'm going to make a bunch of money, and then I'm going, to, I'm going to use that. I'm going to hold that over my kids' heads, and they're going to know they better come and be. They don't even have to be nice to me. They just have to visit me, all right? You can do things like that, and you should do things like that. Don't let your attorney cut and paste your name and put it in place of the person before and call that an estate plan. That's not an estate plan. That's a set of documents that are, that are good, and they're beneficial, but they're not what you need. What you need is, is a set of instructions to the trustee of how you want your estate administered, okay? So be creative. It's kind of fun to be creative. The trust is created by a settler. You're the settler or the trustor. You can, you can use those interchangeably. So trust is a set of instructions to a person created by you, the settler, and you're entrusting some or all of your assets to the trustee to be held for your beneficiaries. It's that simple. A trust will be 20-something pages long because it needs to comply with the, with the laws. It, and it has to be written in accordance with the laws. That's why you shouldn't be doing it yourself. If it doesn't comply with the laws, then it doesn't avail itself of the protection of the laws. Probate. doesn't protect you from probate. Okay? The trustee owes a fiduciary duty to the beneficiaries. And that fiduciary duty, that's a concept. You should remember this. Write this down so that you can use this. Uh, over the holiday break in whatever funny games that you play. What is a fiduciary? A fiduciary is, most people don't understand it. If you're a fiduciary or a trustee, you should understand it. It means you owe a heightened duty to the beneficiaries. That doesn't mean reasonable duty or reasonable person duty. Okay, you're not gonna, if you mismanage this money, you're not gonna be held to the reasonable person standard. You'll be held to the, what should a really smart, reasonable person have done in this circumstance, only looking out for the best, best interest of the beneficiaries. Okay. Now, if you're going to write an estate plan, this is very important. This is a very important topic. You should give a set of instructions to your trustee on how you want the trustee to manage those assets. Don't pretend like your attorney knows what you want. Some people want the, want the trustee to invest in high high risk, high reward type situations. 
Some people are going to say, preserve my estate at all costs. Go put it in the bank earning virtually nothing in a highly insured bank account. Or some people will say, I made a ton of money in real estate. Trustee, you're to go find some money in real estate, and here are the two or three advisors that you should be working with because I know they'll make this money money. Does that make sense? So tell your trustee how you want your trustee to invest that money. Don't just take the, the, the form version that your attorney used in the previous estate plan. That's a bad idea. Because, again, it's your stuff. Shouldn't you be telling the trustee what to do with it? Yeah, you should. For the sake of time and simplicity, I'm going to really just talk about two trusts, irrevocable trusts and revocable trusts. They're both living trusts. All right? Living means you created it while you were alive. Most people do this stuff while they're alive. There are some things called testamentary trusts, which is a trust within a trust. It says, upon my death, create this trust. That's a testamentary trust. So we're going to talk about living trusts created while you're alive. You grant assets into the trust during your lifetime. So what does a trust own? Okay, you create this trust. Now you've got this set of documents. You've worked hard with your estate planning attorney, and now you're, you think you've got a real plan that will work. How do you get your stuff into it? It's simple. You have a house. Go prepare a deed that says Sonny and Bandy, hereby quick claim to Sonny and Bandy, trustees of the Sonny and Bandy Living Trust, the home located at. You create that trust, or you create that deed, you take it to the county recorder's office, now my trust owns that piece of property. I can revoke it if I want, I can sell it if I want. I can do whatever I want with it, I can live in it. For all intents and purposes, you own it, just as you did before, you're just changing the titling. Which goes back to what we talked about in our first episode. Probate has mostly to do with titling. So if I pass under this hypothetical and I've deeded this property into my trust, my wife is the, is the surviving trustee. She's also one of the beneficiaries. She doesn't need to go change the title. The trust didn't die. I died. And I didn't own it anymore. My trust owned it. Okay? I have equitable title. That means it's still mine. But legal title is vested with my trust. And it's that simple. So in a living trust, most of them say if I become incapacitated, then... Uh, the successor trustee should take over and manage the trust. So I usually write them so that the husband and wife are the trustees of their own trust. That's usually what you want to do. And then you want to have a successor, a trusted uh, friend or associate. I don't like to use children unless you absolutely want to. And only after I've made you sign something saying, I understand that this is putting this son or daughter in a very difficult spot. You really don't want a, your children to be in the middle of a, of of uh, administering your, your estate, in my opinion, because then other people are second-guessing what that person's doing and why they're doing it. Are they doing it to protect their own interest? Are they doing it to hold this money over my head? Are they doing it because I stole their bike when I was 10 or I was mean to them when I was 13? All these things come up. So you name, you could name a banker, name your, your insurance agent, name your friend, name your uncle, name your cousin. But I don't like to advise people to, to name a son or a daughter. I just think it's a bad idea. Okay? Uh, that's a choice that you make. So you name a successor trustee, and that's somebody that's going to take over when you're either gone or you don't want to do it anymore or you can't do it anymore. That's the living trust. Grab a video camera, walk around your house or your farm or your estate, and just narrate. Here's my tractor. I want my tractor to go to Mike. You know, here's, here's this. Here's the painting. Here's my fridge. Here's my couch. Here's all my jewelry. I want all this to go to these people. And then you take that CD out or that that drive out and you, you attach it to your trust. You tape it onto it or you put it in a safety deposit box. You make some reference that you have it. That's the easiest way. Or you can take a set of, you can take a matrix like an Excel spreadsheet and you hand write in jewelry to Joanna, you know, tractor to Mike. And you just write it out and your trust will say, trustee, go to Schedule A. Distribute everything on Schedule A before you do anything else. And that's usually what most people want. Mom and dad are gone. They want, they want that. Like me, I wanted my dad's burial flag. So that's what I was interested in. So you want to go execute what's on Schedule A, and that will get rid of the, the, little, the stuff. But you can't do that with like a parcel of property or a farm or something like that. You need to take care of that differently. Don't put your cars in it unless you've got a car that's going to appreciate, like a 73 Jeep CG5, CJ5 or something like that. Or maybe you've got a you know, 50th anniversary Corvette. You know, something that's going to appreciate, and I'd like one if anybody has one. <laughs> so if you have something like that, you know, you may want to put that in your trust. If you're driving, 
your 2002 Ford F-350 like me, don't put that in there. That's going to depreciate and it's something that, that's easy to sell. So a lot of people ask me, what do you do with bank accounts? Do you really have one? Yeah. What color is it? Is, it's our is it for sale? No. Oh, yeah, it's hard to find those for sale. Um, bank accounts are really what other people want to know about. Bank accounts is the easiest thing to change. Go down to your bank, meet with your banker, have your banker execute a card, and every bank has a different procedure that just says, who now is the, is the legal title owner to this account? You change it from Sonny to the Sonny and Bandy Family Living Trust. Then the trust owns it. You use the same checks. It's the same account number, the same account history. It's so simple. Don't let that, don't let that stop you. Yeah, I mean, it's so simple. And I like to do that. And so I'm going to tell you another big pitfall. This is the two things I want you to, if you remember nothing else, don't transfer property but while you're alive without filing that give tax return and knowing that you're going to pay capital gains. Don't do that. Do it through a trust agreement with an attorney advising you on what your tax consequences will be. The second thing that you never, ever, ever, ever want to do is put your children on your account as a joint tenant out of a matter of convenience. Don't let your parents do that as a matter of convenience because you know what will happen? If you're a joint tenant, you have, you have joint legal title to that account, and even though you're just on there writing checks for mom so she doesn't have to, when she dies, as a matter of law, that money goes to you. And if you want to be fair and give it back to your siblings, it's a gift that might be subject to gift tax. Okay? So you don't do that. What you do is you just execute a simple document that says, I am a power of attorney. Sonny, you're now my power of attorney. You can write checks out of my account. And you never, ever put somebody on there as a joint tenant unless you know that when you die, they get that money. So what happens is the son or daughter will have that money, that 200 grand sitting in their account, and sad to say, uh, this is what I see litigated most often. Then you've got the spouse saying, man, we sure need that money, you know, the in-law. And son or daughter saying, well, mom and dad wanted that to go over here, you know. Well, are you sure? You sure did take care of them forever, you know. Shouldn't you take out 10000 of that for you? And pretty soon you've got a fight going on. And your spouse is well-intentioned, the, the son or daughter is well-intentioned, but it can go south so fast. Don't ever trust that it will work itself out because it won't. They'll end up in my office, Okay. These estate planning vehicles, you can handwrite stuff on there. You can put your wishes and desires on there. Just notarize it, sign it, initial it, do something so that you can evidence that these were your wishes and not just somebody trying to commit a fraud. Okay? Another thing, uh, I want a big case in my second year of practicing law, and I just thought I was awesome. I won it on a technicality. Somebody was trying to probate a trust that didn't have a valid signature on it. And I won because the judge said, that trust is not valid. It doesn't have a valid signature. And everybody knew that was the trust. That was mom and dad's trust. Well, my job was to uh, zealously advocate for my client. And we got all the assets. The other side didn't. My client ended up being fair after, the, after we won. But make sure that your estate planner gives you a second copy, handwritten, or a second copy where you've signed in, in red or blue ink. So that if so that there's always two copies of your trust laying around, right? Because most laws will say that uh, 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 unless it's in fresh ink, it, it doesn't qualify because it could have been forged, even if you had to hire a handwriting expert, which they did, to say that it wasn't forged, okay? So if you sit down and sign a revocable family living trust, say, hey, where's my other copy? And let's sign it. You want fresh ink on it. So you'll have two fresh copies and ten copies, one in a safety deposit box and one with all your kids. That's the way I advise people. I like my kids to know what they're going to get. I want them on their best behavior. I'll disinherit them so fast. <laughs> so let's go to an irrevocable trust, all right? I think this is something that is underutilized because people in, in Utah are notoriously cheap. You, you, you amass wealth if you're frugal. But I want to educate everybody in the room and everybody watching that irrevocable trusts are used far more often in most other states than they are here in Utah, and I can't quite figure it out. Again, attorneys, we win either way. If, if I'm trying to sue somebody, they've wronged my client, and now I've got a judgment, and I want their stuff to pay that judgment, and something is placed in, an, in a revocable trust, even though it's titled in the name of the trust, because it's freely revocable, it's part of your estate. I get to go take that trust property and sell it and pay my client for their judgment. 
So if I put, let's use a hypothetical. I run somebody over on my, they're on a bike. I take them out, kill them, one and a half million dollar judgment, wrongful death judgment against me. $100,000 in insurance covers it. $1.4 million deficiency. They go to the county records. They find that I, that I at some point held property at my house in Salem. Like, hey, do you still own that? No, I don't own it. My trust owns it. Well, is your trust revocable? Yeah, it's revocable. All right, what's it worth? Well, it's worth this much. They can come in as a judgment creditor, sell that piece of property, and pay their judgment as a deficiency judgment creditor. So how do you avoid that? You create an irrevocable trust agreement. The trust agreement says everything it said before. I'm transferring this property to be held in trust for these beneficiaries, but it's irrevocable. So don't put anything in there that you don't want to be able to transfer later. That's the rub. So if I transfer my house in Salem irrevocably to the trust, I get to live in it for the rest of my life. My beneficiaries get it upon my death. I run somebody over on a bike. They have a $1.4 million deficiency judgment. If I did that, it's protected. There are some, a few nuances that they could use to kind of hack at that, that the, the, the plaintiff's counsel could use to hack at it to try and tear it apart, but it's going to stand up because I don't own it anymore. I gave it to my trust for my kids upon my death. I can't ever transfer it. I can never control it again because I can't control it. It's not mine. Okay? Does that make sense? If you have elderly parents that aren't going to move, have them transfer their homes into an irrevocable trust agreement. They get to stay in it the rest of their life. They can transfer it to their kids upon their death. All right? And it creates... Uh, it saves the capital gains tax issue that I told you about earlier because mom and dad always bought back in the 40s and everything appreciated. He transferred upon their death. No, it's no capital gains tax. Like my 82-year-old grandma client down there in St. George that ran over the Ironman athlete, if she did that and she doesn't own that house, they can't take that house. It's, it's irrevocably transferred away. Okay? Do you, do you understand the concept? Does anybody have any questions about that concept? Why wouldn't you do that? It sounds like it depends on your age, though. You can under some extenuating circumstances. I'll give you an example. If all of the beneficiaries agree, and in, in that scenario, your kids would probably be minors, so that doesn't factor in. Let's say you're older and you want to move to Florida and buy a condo in Florida. You don't want to be here in the cold anymore. If all your beneficiaries agree, then you just sell it, you go buy something of like value in Florida, and you put that in your irrevocable trust. So it's a like kind exchange. Let's say that you're, you've got some, some minors. You need to buy something of almost the exact same kind of value and almost the exact same kind of location. You want to just go buy something that is very similar and you want to get an attorney's advice so that they're cover the, so the attorney's giving you good advice and covering your rear end if anybody ever said, hey, you know, you're just, you're just trying to get that property back. Or if a creditor said, that was a sham, you own that property the whole time. You always meant to transfer that out. Does that make sense? So you can. You can do it, but you've got to be super careful and only do it after the advice of an attorney. So what happens if my wife and I have a home, we both pass away. Our home is in the irrevocable trust, and we both pass away. The home then goes to the children. Do you, do you, do you distinguish who's going to take that house after you're gone? Well, like, like, the, revoc the, trust. like the revocable trust, it's entirely flexible and pliable. You can do whatever you want. You could say, upon my death, upon the last of us to die, I want it sold. Proceeds distributed to my kids in equal shares. Or you could say, I didn't like Johnny. Johnny was rude to me. Johnny doesn't get anything. Sell it, Johnny gets nothing. But Johnny's kids get, get his share. You know, you could do something like that. You could say, um, nobody gets to live in it and it gets rented for fair market value for 20 years. And after 20 years and it's appreciated, then you sell it. You can do whatever you want. Yeah. You just, uh, you know, be creative. That's the problem I find with most estate, well, with some estate planning attorneys. They're not creative. The more time they spend with you because they charge a flat fee, the less their margin is. Okay? And that's, uh, that's okay. I mean, you just got to make sure that you, you find somebody that cares about you and your family's needs so they're not concerned about the profit they're going to make. Because, honestly, the more time you spend, the less their profit's going to be. So be careful. Yeah. So you can do almost anything you want, but once you write it down and it's signed, then it's irrevocable, and then you can't change that. That's right, because that person, your beneficiary, has a vested interest. 
has a vested interest in that gift. All right? Make sure that you put something called a spendthrift clause. And most good estate planning attorneys in Utah are doing this right now. The spendthrift clause says, trustee, before you make the gift, hold your horses a little bit. Make sure they don't have family problems. Make sure they're not going to go through a divorce. Make sure that they're not charged with a crime or going through bankruptcy. or Just make sure that that money's not going to go to a creditor. It's basically what you're saying. And it's a paragraph about that long. You know, Just make sure that you've got a spendthrift provision in there so that you don't give money to, a, to somebody that's just going to go have it taken by a creditor or, give it, or half of it given away in a, in a divorce. You know, most trusts that I've seen in Utah County with competent planners, they'll say, trustee, you're to, use, you're to use discretion first. You're to check and make sure that there aren't any creditors. You're to, to make this gift and, and ensure that it's, that it's going to hold its value. You know, there, there are all kinds of provisions that are put in there. And trustees are going to be naturally suspicious to begin with because hopefully they've been advised that, hey, you're a fiduciary now. You're held to a really high standard. Criminal. It could be criminal to spend somebody else's money wisely. Okay. I want to tell you about a charitable trust. Uh, charitable trusts are great. A lot of people pay tithing in this valley. Um, I don't mean to make this, and this is not an LDS estate planning seminar, but I find that a lot of people I advise are LDS. Um, you, can, you can set up charitable trusts where you can donate a large portion of a capital gain on a property to LDS philanthropies for instance, uh, uh, or the Boy Scouts of America, America or, so, or the United Way, some big charity, you can transfer that property to the charity. You can get a, a great big income tax exemption or deduction for making the gift to the charity. You can avoid some capital gains taxes. And so this, these are laws that are written by our Congress that are they're saying, hey, we're going to incentivize you to give money to charities. So a charitable lead annuity trust or a charitable remainder annuity trust and so if, you're, if, if you want, write those down or Google those to find out more about them. We just don't have time to do it today. But there are charitable trusts that are out there that can help you save a lot of capital gains tax money. And, and for me personally, I'd rather that go to an, a charity than to go fill the government's coffers. That's just the way I, I think, and I advise many of my clients that way. There's one other I want to tell you about, special needs trust. If you have anybody in your family that, is, that receives government aid, Maybe you've got a son or a daughter that has Social Security, dis- that receives SSID, Social Security Disability, or Medicaid, or something like that. You can make gifts to your kids through your trusts without them losing their government funding moving forward. So the last thing you want to do is make a gift to your 21-year-old son, give him $1,000 irrevocably, and now all of a sudden they get $1,000 and they don't qualify for these government aid programs anymore. So you do it through a special needs trust. The special needs trust will ensure that the child receives their benefits and the gift will remain. Okay, so special needs trust, extremely important. Choosing the right trustee. This is the biggest problem that I see people make and that I see planners make. They just glaze right over this. Who do you want to be your trustee? I want my oldest son. Okay, they write it down. Again, the less time you spend with your client, the more... I feel like I'm Jerry Maguire and I'm writing this manifesto and I'm going to be blackballed by every attorney in Utah now. I don't care. Okay? There's, this is my manifesto. The more time they spend with you, the less their profit margin will be. Don't let that happen. Just be smart. Say, you know, who, who would you think? I've got a client now. He's brilliant. He says, well, who would you use? Every time I ask a question, well, who would you use? Then we enter into this discussion. That's the best question you should ask. Who, should, who would you use? What have other people done? What are some problems that you've seen? What are some things that your law firm have seen, has seen based upon decisions that your clients have made? But as a, as a good rule of thumb, I don't like to use children. I really like to use a neighbor that, that, that knows you, knows your family, that has some wherewithal when it comes to finances, can read a spreadsheet, understand a bank account. Uh, you know, it's okay to use aunts and uncles, people that are close to the family that you'll have a better relationship with. But think of it this way. Look at this choosing the right trustee and look at the smaller print. These are going to be the duties of your trustee. You're dead and gone and so is your spouse and this is somebody now administering your trust. They're going to safeguard the trust investment assets. They need to maintain accurate records. They need to distribute trust income and principal according to the directions and not their own subjective wills and wishes. They're going to maintain contact with the beneficiaries and provide them with data. They're going to manage conflict. They're going to file tax returns 
and day-to-day -day financial affairs. So that's what that person's going to do. And so I can tell you right there, there's one problem, managing conflict. If you already have conflict in your family between a, a sibling, then why would you put another sibling in the middle of that? Or what if one of those siblings is the one that's having the conflict? They're just going to blackball the other person. Well, that's not fair. It's intuitive, but it's not fair. So you don't, that's why I don't like to use family members. Maintaining contact with the other beneficiaries. There might be somebody in the family that this trustee doesn't like, so naturally they're going to spend less time with that person. Okay? So this is someone that has some significant, significant authority uh, to act on your behalf. So I want to thank you for coming. I want to thank the council uh, for, for the opportunity to do this. And if you have any questions, you can always contact me. My number is 801-812-1000. You can Google my name. Um, I, I will be happy to give you the names of four partners in my law firm that I'll do estate planning. No, I'll give you three names of attorneys, myself included, that you could go to if you needed some advice. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sonny, again, for coming down and speaking to us today. And thank all of you that have been watching at home and all of you here that uh, have joined us today. And um, thank you, Channel 17.